Hello, 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 and welcome back. You are listening to the Emblex Review Course for Anatomy and Physiology for the Upper Body. Are you ready to have some fun? This is going to be a wild ride. There's a lot to cover. We are going to review the shoulder and arm, forearm and wrist and hand. Now, as a reminder, this is a review course, so we're not relearning the material. However, there are some specific things I have covered in these slides that I know to be on the national exam. National exam I use interchangeably with MBLEX because the MBLEX is our national exam. So again, this is meant to be a review class, but there are several slides that cover origin, insertion, and action. So if you'd like to pause on those slides, just you know hit the pause button and you can uh, stay on that slide a little longer if you want to read through the material. But as I said, there's a lot of material to cover and we have just about an hour to do it. So you ready? All right, let's get this done. The first half of this class focuses on the shoulder and the arm and all of the muscles, bones, and bony landmarks, as well as some ligaments of the shoulder and the arm to start. This slide demonstrates a topographical view of the upper body. So just like a topographical map shows you the lay of the land, this is kind of a general lay of the land. Let's start in the upper right hand corner where you see a chromium and trapezius. So you'll see the trapezius muscle in the clavicle. The clavicle is the anatomical name for the collarbone. The acromion is right on the end of the shoulder. It's actually part of the shoulder blade, which we'll see shortly, but the acromion is out in that region. Pectoralis major, deltoid, and biceps, biceps brachii. Moving to the lower right-hand corner of our screen, you'll see a few other topographical regions. The trapezius, you'll see again. Spine of the scapula, nice term there. We'll see that demonstrated more clearly in another slide when we're looking at bony landmarks. We have the inferior angle of the scapula, the triceps brachii right there, a little uh, pointer to the latissimus dorsi, uh, and spinous process of C7. Now, to me, that seems like it's going to be a little low, but you can find that bony landmark because right at the base of your cervical spine, there's one bone that really protrudes, that's C7. Uh, and the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae are also highlighted there for you. And finally, that middle figure, we're seeing a, a lateral view with an arm raised. And you'll see, again, where the deltoid lives, the triceps, the axilla is actually the armpit, latissimus dorsi, and the serratus anterior. Now, do any of these terms seem unfamiliar? If so, feel free to Google words that you don't know. Just pause this video and go ahead and Google it. You'll get a bit more information. In, on the upper body, we can explore the skin and the fascia as a body worker. Fascia is the thin sheath of connective tissue that surrounds all of our muscles and organs. And you can see some images here of how we explore restrictions within that fascia. Fascia and skin is a great assessment tool. All right, are you ready for some common names of the bones of the shoulder and arm? All right, let's highlight the kind of pinkish red bones. You'll see the clavicle. What's the common name of the clavicle? Think about that. You'll see the humerus and the scapula. Moving to the right side of the image, you see the sternoclavicular joint. The acromioclavicular joint, the AC joint on the lateral end of the clavicle. The shoulder joint, otherwise known as the glenohumeral joint. The sternum, what's the common name of the sternum? And highlighted here too are the ribs. So back to our questions, the common name of the clavicle, the collarbone, yeah. Common name of the scapula, the shoulder blade, yes. And can you think of the common name of the sternum? Some people call that the breastbone or the breastplate. Those are the bones of the shoulders and arm. We'll get into more detail in just a few minutes. So why are bony landmarks 
uh, of interest to us. Bodhi landmarks help us to identify muscles and trigger points. Here you're going to see an anterior view of the right scapula. A little bit hard to imagine, so look at that tiny picture of the shoulder and imagine that anterior view. So here you'll see the acromion, which is actually part of the scapula, guys. It's not part of the clavicle. The acromion is part of the scapula. A couple of other important things, the superior angle, the upper right-hand corner there, the area where the subscapula lives, the subscapular fossa, right under that medial border. So remember, is medial on the inside or on the outside of the body? Right, the medial border is on the inside, closest to the spine. We're working our way around the bottom here of the, these bony landmarks, the inferior angle of the scapula. And then coming uh, up and around, you'll see the glenoid cavity. That's where the glenohumeral joint is going to form. This image shows us the posterior view of the right scapula. This is the view we're used to seeing as body workers. So when someone is laying uh, prone on your table, so they're laying face down, this is the view we have of their scapula. So superior angle, working down that medial border. Remember the spine of the scapula, that is a great bony landmark because right under that spine of the scapula, is where the infraspinatus lives in the infraspinatus fossa. We're going to cover that more in detail in a little bit. Inferior angle leads us right up to the lateral border. And you'll see right out there on the edge, the acromion. Again, the acromion is part of the scapula. And then that superior notch is also um, the supraspinous fossa lives in there. Oh, you'll see supraspinous fossa right in there. It's where the supraspinatus um, lives. Again, we're going to get into more detail in just a few minutes, but an overview of where we're going. Here you are looking at the humerus, which is the long bone of the upper arm. The greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle are at the proximal end of the bone. Proximal. Now, what is the opposite of proximal? Yes, distal. So the proximal end is closest to the body. The distal end is normally farthest away. Now note, in the lower right-hand corner, the medial supracondyle ridge, which is the bony landmark on the humerus that houses the forearm flexors. Just saying, you probably want to remember that. The medial supracondyle ridge is the bony landmark that houses the forearm flexors. As previously mentioned, the lesser tubercle is also at the proximal end of the bone, but this is a little bit different view, a posterior view of the right humerus. The humerus is a long bone. All of the bones in the appendicular skeleton are long bones, with the exception of the wrist and the ankle. Remember the difference between the appendicular and the axial skeleton? That was from one of our early review days. That's right. Appendicular is the exterior, the outside part, and the axial is the spine, thorax, rib cage. Just a quick review there. We're not seeing it, but maybe we will later. I'd like to acknowledge Books of Discovery's Trail Guide to the Body and thank them very much for the slides and the images that we have to use here. These are some bony landmark trails from Trail Guide to the Body. Trail one is along the edges. Let's just take a look at a few of these edges. A is the spine of the scapula. B is the medial border of the scapula. C, the inferior angle. D, the superior angle. And E, the lateral border. Those are all of the scapula. If we look over to trail two in the trenches, we look at where uh, the infraspinatus, supraspinatus, and subscapularis live. They live in this, these depressions, these little indentations. So A is the infraspinous fossa, B is the supraspinous fossa, and C is the subscapular fossa. That's underneath. You see how that arrow goes underneath? It lives underneath the scapula. Again, feel free to pause this video at any point if you'd like to take a closer look. A lot of this stuff we're just going to briefly review. It has to do with body work. Uh, so the trail number one along the edges, the spine of the scap, serves as a great landmark to find the infraspinatus. 
Uh, likewise, the medial border of this gap serves as a great landmark to find the trapezius. Likewise, trail number two in the trenches gives us some bony landmarks and areas we can find some yummy muscles to work. The infraspinatus bossa. Fossa is a hollowed out area, and in this image on the shoulder blade, the infraspinatus lives here, right under the spine of the scapula. Supraspinatus fossa, again, is the depression or hollowed out area. The supraspinatus lives right at the top there of that scapula muscle, that scapula bone. Tucked right in there is the supraspinatus rotator cuff. By now you're familiar that fossa is a scooped out area and the subscapular fossa is the scooped out area under the scapula where the subscapularis lives. Having trigger points in the subscapularis can lead to frozen shoulder. And the easiest way to access this uh, is uh, while the client is actually in sideline position um, to get there, or uh, actually there's a technique also for supine, but demonstrated here is in sideline position. Trail guide to the body calls trail number three, the springboard ledge. The acromium is a bony process on the scapula that extends laterally over the shoulder joint. See image 2.25 for the location of the acromium. Moving to the right-hand side of the screen, the clavicle is the anatomical name for the collarbone. The AC joint is formed between the acromium and the clavicle. Insertion point for the subclavius. Origin point for the SCM. So the AC joint is the, the clavicle is the insertion point for the subclavius, the origin point for the SCM. What does the SCM stand for? The sternoclavicular mastoid muscle. We're going to spend a little time on this AC joint, the acromioclavicular joint. As a reminder, the AC joint is between the scapula and the clavicle, but it's also where thoracic outlet syndrome is occurring. Thoracic outlet syndrome is a group of disorders that occur when the blood vessels or the nerves in the space between the collarbone and the first rib, which is the thoracic outlet, become compressed. This can cause pain in the neck, the shoulder, numbness in the fingers. The pain results from the compression on the brachial plexus. So the AC joint, the acromioclavicular joint, is right at that shoulder and it's where thoracic outlet syndrome occurs. Ah, the sternoclavicular joint. Great place to do a little body work, just at that SC joint and just above the clavicle. Can you guess what two anatomical structures make up the sternoclavicular joint? If you guess the sternum and the clavicle, you'd be correct. Moving away from bony landmarks, we now move into the muscles of the shoulders and arm. Each of these muscles will probably look pretty familiar. Let's go around the circle. Starting at 9 p.m., we have latissimus dorsi, triceps, teres major and teres minor. We see a general area of the infraspinatus, but we've learned quite specifically where that lives. The deltoid is highlighted here in red, and the trapezius in the two sides of that trapezius make the, sa the shape of a trapezoid. Going past 12 o'clock where the head is, moving to the right-hand side of the screen, splenus capitis, the levator scap, rhomboids major and minor are in red, supraspinatus, We've already covered that. Infra on the right. Teres minor on the right. Teres major and triceps on the right. As you move down to about the five o'clock place on the clock, erector spinae group, and that is sometimes abbreviated as ESG, the erector spinae group. Serratus posterior and inferior, and that concludes our look at the muscles of the shoulder, the general look of the muscles of the shoulder and arm. Reminder, if any of these muscles seem unfamiliar to you, feel free to pause and just Google them. You'll get a little bit more information. We're going to go into much more depth right now as far as origins, insertions, but we're doing so as a review. So if you feel like you want more information, pause and dig it up. We have a lateral view now of the muscles of the shoulder and arm. And again, those major muscles that you'll be familiar with. 
starting at the lower left-hand side of your screen, the latissimus dorsi from the side. Teres major and minor. Really, our focus is going to be the teres minor. Infraspinatus, deltoid, trapezius, and levator scap. See how the levator scap comes under the trap? We'll be looking, we'll be reviewing these muscles more in depth shortly. Moving to the right-hand side of your screen, the SCM, the sternoclavicular mastoid has been cut away from this image. Biceps, brachialis, triceps, serratus anterior, just a little peeking out there, and an external oblique. One more look at the muscles of the shoulder and arm from the anterior view. Do any of these muscles seem unfamiliar? Again, SCM, sternoclavicular mastoid. The trapezius, you can just see peeking over when from this anterior view. We've got a deltoid, pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, again, just peeking around the corner. The serratus anterior, biceps, and an external oblique. On the right side of your screen, we see the levator scapula. The deltoid's been cut away to expose pec minor, and the coracobrachialis, serratus anterior on the right side, and that big muscle that runs right down the middle of our abdomen, rectus abdominis. Synergists are muscles that work together. We're looking at synergists of the glenohumeral joint, otherwise known as the shoulder joint. And for flexion, you can see the muscles that work together. Now the glenohumeral joint is a freely movable joint and is functionally classified as a diarthrotic joint. This gives us an opportunity to review the types of joints. Types of joints are synanthrotic, which is super fibrous with little to no movement, like the sutures of the skull. The amphiarthrotic, which is like kind of a cartilaginous joint. You get slight movement in that cartilaginous joint. So kind of like where the pubic synthesis, synthesis comes together. But the shoulder is a diarthrotic joint, synovial joints. So they're freely movable. As we move through the synergists, the muscles that work together, as we move through the synergists of the shoulder joint, wanted to also throw in just a few more vocabulary terms. The anterior view is sometimes called the ventral view. It refuse, it normally ventral refers to an animal um, and it's anterior, but it's more so the abdominal view or the underneath view like the belly. So here we have an anterior view, but sometimes called the ventral view. Here we have the posterior view of a back, uh, and sometimes that's called the dorsal view. Again, more so for animals, like the dorsal fin on the dolphin's back. Ventral and dorsal go together, um, but this is also an opportunity for us to review some of our terms from navigating the body. body. Here we're reviewing the motions of the shoulder joint. We have horizontal abduction and horizontal adduction. So abduction and adduction here demonstrated. More synergists of the glenohumeral joint. We have abduction of the shoulder joint done by the deltoid and the supraspinatus. And traditional adduction of the shoulder joint done mostly by the latissimus dorsi and teres minor. minor. Go ahead and demonstrate a deduction at your shoulder joint. Can you do that? Where does your arm have to start to produce the movement of a deduction? Right, it would have to be parallel to the ground, moving toward your body. Adduction at the shoulder joint. We're now going to review a few movements of the scapula. The scapula actually sometimes is called the scapulothoracic joint. Even though there is not a joint, the scapula glides across the thoracic region of the spine and therefore is sometimes referred to as the scapulothoracic joint. So we review here actions of the scapula. Elevation and the muscles that work together, the synergists that elevate the shoulder blade, and depression of the shoulder blade, depression of the scapula. Another group of synergists working together to create movement in the scapula. 
I found this slide very interesting because we wanted, I wanted to make the distinction between upward rotation of the scapula and elevation of the scapula. You can see the difference in direction. And so downward rotation of the scapula actually means a, a little twist of the scapula versus just depression of the scapula. So I, I liked that distinction. Makes it a little clearer when we talk about upward rotation versus elevation. Ah, a classic slide from school. This is the deltoid muscle, and on it you'll see the action, uh, the origin, the insertion, and the innerviation, classically from school. Now, you don't have to memorize all of these things. What I want you to do is be very familiar, though, with um, where the deltoid is located. We're going to get into a few, little bit more detail uh, in the next few slides. To find the muscle belly of the deltoid, find these three bony landmarks and you'll be in good shape. The acromion, the lateral one-third of the clavicle. Now think about that. Look where the deltoid is. Are you going to find the medial aspect of the clavicle? The, the middle part of the clavicle? No, you're going to go to the lateral, the end of the clavicle, the lateral one-third, and then the deltoid tuberosity. They make a V-shape on the arm. The deltoid is superficial and you'll feel the anterior and posterior fibers quite easily. Our old friend, the trapezius. The trapezius upwardly rotates the scapula, otherwise known as the scapular thoracic joint, and it has both upper fibers, middle fibers, and lower fibers in the trapezius. All the details you'd ever want to know about the trapezius as far as the movements, so the action, that's the little blue box with an A in it. The blue box with the O is the origin. The blue box with the I is the insertion, where it starts and where it ends. And then the innerviation of the trapezius as well. Everything you'd ever want to know about a trap. To palpate the upper, middle, and lower fibers of the trapezius, have your client in prone position with the arm at 90 degree angle hanging off the side of the table. Find the muscle belly of the middle fibers of the trapezius by sliding medial and superior from the spine of the scapula. I'm going to repeat that. Find the muscle belly of the middle fibers of the trap by sliding medial and superior from the spine of the scapula. A very familiar muscle will be the latissimus dorsi. Here you can read the action, origin, insertion and innervation of that very large muscle. Notice that this latissimus dorsi also, uh, its fascia attaches to the iliac crest, the posterior iliac crest. Terry's major is really outdone by its smaller, uh, more active um, partner, Terry's minor. But take a peek here and see where Terry's major is with the action origin. Again, insertion and innerviation. Synergists are muscles that work together. And the latissimus dorsi and the teres major sometimes work together. They are sometimes referred to as the handcuff muscles, since the actions of the lats and the teres major bring the arms into an arresting position, so behind the back to be cuffed. That's why they're sometimes called the handcuff muscles the latissimus dorsi and the teres major. They bring the arms back into extension, adduction, and medial rotation, as if someone were being handcuffed behind their back. By now you're familiar with our SITS muscles. S-I-T-S is an acronym that represents the rotator cuff muscles. Supraspinatus gets us started. Yet another rotator cuff muscle, the infraspinatus, one of my favorites. Teres minor makes up the T of our SIT sits muscles. Teres minor is a lovely muscle to work with our clients. And the final in our sits muscle groups, the subscapularis. A little bit difficult to work uh, on a person if they're not having if they're having a passive versus active massage. Uh, however, lovely to reduce shoulder tension. 
So can you tell that I really want you to understand these rotator cuff muscles? Because here's a few more slides on them. The original program that is taught in school had about an additional 75 slides. Uh, it went into a lot of detail. Even though it feels like we're going into a lot of detail, uh, just know that I've eliminated a lot of uh, other material. The supraspinatus, to have proxy, proper access to the supraspinatus tendon, internally rotate, extend, and abduct the humerus. Look at the arrows on image 2.61 to understand that better. Supraspinatus. Moving along to the infraspinatus, it's the one of the three muscles that perform lateral rotation of the glenohumeral joint. What are the other two muscles that perform lateral rotation at the shoulder joint? Okay, an easy one is the deltoid, right? Right, and teres minor. So the three muscles that perform lateral rotation of the shoulder joint are the deltoid, teres minor, and infraspinatus. Teres minor is often extremely sore on our clients. It's palpated by placing the fingers on the lateral border of the scapula and pressing towards the spine. So staying very parallel to the massage table, moving towards the spine. In image 2.63, if you have your um, client rotate the shoulder while you grasp the teres minor, great way to get some circulation in there. Moving along to the subscapularis, subscap is in charge of medial and internal rotation. So if the client has not had any musculoskeletal trauma or disorders of the shoulder, trigger points in the subscap are often the cause of frozen, frozen shoulder syndrome. Do you feel like you're seeing a flashcard? <laughs> Rhomboid major and minor pictured here with the action, origin, insertion, and innerviation. Feel free to pause if you need a little bit more time on the rhomboid. Some of the questions on your MBLEX exam are directional. And so we did get a question on the rhomboids as to the best way to access them. Here's an image. The best way to access the rhomboids while the client is in prone position is to place their hand on the small of their back. The fibers of the rhomboids run like a Christmas tree down from the spine to the medial border of the scapula. You can see in image 2.75, the, the traction, the, the track of those rhomboids. Oh, some massage therapists tell me the levator scapula is one of their favorite muscles to work. Again, you'll see in images here, typically when we've got a little tweak in the neck, it's the fibers of the levator scapula that are the culprit. Here in uh, image 2.77, the lateral view, you can see um, the levator scapula situated between the posterior scalenes and the splenus capitis. So make a note there, situated between the posterior scalenes and the splenus capitis is the levator scapula. Because of the movements it's responsible for, if the superior angle of the scapula was tender to the touch, the levator scapula is usually causing the pain. Working this muscle is best done in side-lying position with the scapula superiorly elevated towards the head. It's easier to feel the superior angle of the scapula that way when it's away from the rib cage if you can get your person into sideline position. Otherwise, work at like two point, the image 2.79. Just get right on in there, maybe have them move their head a little bit. Personally, I prefer supine position to work the levator scapula. And to get to the posterior fibers of the scalenes, you must go through the middle scalenes and the levator scapula. Pictured here beautifully in 2.85 image uh, is uh, and an example of head movement while working the levator scapula. Pictured here is the serratus anterior. Sometimes people lose track of where the serratus anterior is. We're in the upper body. It's along the rib cage. Muscle fibers are underneath the scapula. And you can see here the action, origin, insertion point, and the innerviation. This is kind of a whirlwind tour through the major muscles of the upper body. 
This is the pectoralis major, and in image 2.88, you can see a beautiful picture of where how the pectoralis major attaches to the clavicle, the sternum, and then also to the costal area, costal area being the ribs. Image 2.93 shows us a beautiful picture of the pectoralis minor muscle with the action, origin, insertion, and innerviation. A tiny muscle, but a strong muscle. Here we have a lovely image of the biceps brachii, short head and the long head of the biceps attaching around the coracoid process. We can also clearly see the bicipital tendons. There's not too many pathologies of the biceps, but if compressed repeatedly, the long head of the bicipital brachii tendon causes pain in the shoulder. So repetitive stress can cause that compression. So for example, swimming four to five times a week can sometimes compress that tendon, causing shoulder pain. The triceps brachii are considered the reciprocal muscle group to the biceps brachii. Here we have lovely view of the three heads of the triceps. So tri meaning three, three heads of this muscle pictured here, just above the olecranon process. I believe we're gonna talk about the olecranon process in just a little bit, but the olecranon process is the elbow joint. Ah, the coracobrachialis. A misunderstood muscle. Well, major movements are flexion of the shoulder and it adducts the arm. So it brings it back toward the body. Major movements of this coracobrachialis are flexion, uh, flexes the shoulder and adducts the, um, the arm. So it's located on the medial side of the upper arm. Look at image 2.111. And it works like the adductors of the leg. The coracobrachialis is almost like the adductors in your leg. It brings that arm back in towards the body. What is the common name of the glenohumeral joint? It is the shoulder. Yes, you may not recognize it the way it's appearing here in this picture. However, it is the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint. So let's take a look at some of these landmarks to the glenohumeral joint. The spine of the scapula, moving around to the clavicle, the acromioclavicular ligament and the acromion, the coracromial ligament, and then the um, rotator cuff muscles have been pulled away. The very bottom, what makes up the humeral joint is the humerus. So the glenoid fossa, the glenoid cavity, and the humerus form that glenohumeral joint. Staying in the shoulder joint, we'll address the subacromial bursa. So what is bursa? It appears in many places in our body, mostly joints. It's small fluid filled sacs. Typically the role of bursa is to reduce friction between tendons and bones. Subacromial bursa is also known as the subdeltoid bursa because a portion of that bursa is between the deltoid and the humerus. Bursitis, I-T-I-S, is inflammation of the bursa typically caused by overuse or repetitive stress. Typically, we cannot feel bursa. The only way to palpate it is it is actually inflamed. Rounding out our view of the shoulder and the upper arm are the axillary lymph nodes and the brachial artery. So the axillary lymph nodes are located in the axilla, in the armpit. These are about a group of about 20 to 30 large lymph nodes located in the deep tissues in and around the armpit. So why do we care? Well, about 75% of the lymph from breasts drain into these nodes, making them very important in the diagnosis of breast cancer. The brachial artery, it's the major blood vessel for the upper arm. It's closely related to the median nerve as it's immediately lateral to the brachial artery. Um, the median nerve is the only nerve that passes through the carpal tunnel. So the median nerve, brachial artery, and carpal tunnel syndrome are all intimately related. Are you hanging in there? Excellent. Well, we have completed our review of the shoulder and the upper arm. We're moving now into the forearm, wrist, and hand. We're over halfway through the class, but if you need to pause, or if you want to pause, get up and stretch. I just did. 
and it's encouraged during these classes to get a glass of water, to do a little stretching, to get a little fresh air, do what you need to do to stay sharp. This is kind of a boring subject, I know, <laughs> but it's important for the bigger picture of what you'll be seeing on the MBLEX exam. So on to our topographical view of the forearm, wrist, and hand. Starting with the upper picture, you'll see a detailed review of the areas of the forearm, wrist, and hand. We see topographically, basically where the brachioradialis would be. We see the olecranon process of the ulna, followed by the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. We're gonna be getting into a much clearer picture of this, but again, a topographical view is kind of like a view from the outside of the bumps and lumps, uh, kind of like a topographical map. Uh, looking at the lower picture, we'll see the bryceps brachy tendon where that attaches. We move into palmaris longus, flexor carpi, radialis. Um, we see the flexors of the forearm and the wrist. The medial epicondyle of the humerus as well is pictured here. And here we have the bones of the forearm and the hand. We're gonna pay particular attention to the bold words, the bold bones. You'll see at the very top of the image, the humerus. Just below that, the humo, humororadial joint formed by the humerus and the radius. The humoroulnar joint and the ulna. Moving down the arm, you see the radius and the ulna, but also you'll see the carpals so carpal tunnel, the carpals are located in the wrist, metacarpals are in the hand, and phalanges are parts of the fingers. Now, when standing in anatomical position, which bone of the forearm is most lateral? So standing in anatomical position, where are your thumbs, in or out? They are out. Okay, so the thumb side, according to this picture, take a look, which is thumb side? Is it the radius or the ulna? Yes, so in standing in anatomical position, the bone of the forearm that is most lateral is the radius. I wanna say thank you again to the authors of Trail Guide to the Body. They are so detailed. We are gonna focus on the major bony landmarks, on the humerus, on the ulna, on the radius, and on the phalanges. You can just see those bones highlighted here. Here are pictured the carpal bones. The carpal bones make up the carpal tunnel. They are sit in and form the carpal tunnel. Everybody has a carpal tunnel, but not everybody has carpal tunnel syndrome. One of these carpal bones is noteworthy, the pisiform. It's considered a sesamoid bone. A sesamoid bone is a bone embedded within the tendon or the muscle. What is the most common sesamoid bone? We covered this in anatomy physiology of the lower body. The most common sesamoid bone is the patella, the kneecap. Here we see the carpals working together as a group. The eight carpal bones sit in the carpal tunnel and it's a fabulous place to massage. Remember our saying, you must get specific to be terrific. Clients love a little more attention to their wrists. And we are truly all connected. Remember back at the shoulder, the brachial plexus, the nerve bundle that runs through the shoulder? Well, the brachial plexus branch that serves the forearm flexors, thumb, and first finger muscles is the median nerve. It runs straight through this carpal tunnel. Here we see an image of the metacarpals and the phalanges. So the metacarpals are in the hand. What are the bones of the feet called? Here were the metacarpals, are the carpals, versus the tarsals. Yes, tarsals are actually in the feet. Carpals, metacarpals are in the hand. Here we can identify several of the major muscles of the forearm and the hand. Starting at the very top of our picture, the biceps brachii come in and attach across the elbow joint. We move into the brachialis and we see the brachioradialis. So the brachialis is upper, brachioradialis is forearm. Flexor pollis longus. That actually is one of our 
finger tendons, the flexor, flexor pollis longus. We'll get into that a little bit more just a little later. On the far right side of our picture, we have a pronator, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, flexor carpi ulnaris, uh, flexor digitorum. It, all of these say flexor, flexor, flexor. They're flexors of the forearm. Here we have a lateral view of the right forearm and hand. And I wanted to point out, you see many of the same muscles, however, there's a few extra in here. When assessing the radiocarpal joint, what muscles would you lengthen to release tension or to decrease a mild extension at the wrist? You would relax the prime movers, the extensors of the radiocarpal joint. So the radiocarpal joint is between the radius and the carpals. So you'd be releasing all of those extensors we see here. The extensor carpi radialis, extensor longus brevis, extensor carpi ulnaris, and extensor digitorum. That would, be, that would be a great way, especially if you were working, if your client was a massage therapist, lovely way to release tension in that forearm. One more picture of some of the deeper muscles of the forearm and hand. In this, please note that the flexors of the forearm are located on the medial side of the olecranon process. The olecranon process um, of the ulna is the elbow. So um, the olecranon process here is pictured on the left-hand side and the flexors are located on the medial side of the elbow. Remember the term synergists? Synergists are muscles that work together. Here are muscles to work together to flex at the elbow joint or extend at the elbow joint. And as you'll see listed on this image, the humeral ulnar and the humeral radial joints are other names for the elbow joints. It's where the humerus, ulnar, and radius come together. Synergists are muscles working together to produce the motion of supination and pronation. Go ahead and demonstrate supination and pronation with your own forearm. Get an idea of that movement. This is a great review of movements in the body from our original course, Navigating the Body. Here at the wrist, the radiocarpal joint, you see extension and flexion. Extension and flexion. To protect your radiocarpal joint when giving a massage, it's best to keep it in a neutral position which helps to maintain the strength of the hand and decrease stress to the joint. Movements of the wrist also include abduction and adduction. Go ahead and abduct your wrist. Move it towards your thumb. So in the image you see there's a rubber band wrapped around the hand, but just move out towards your thumb. Move that wrist in a plane. Now go ahead and adduct your wrist. Is one movement easier than the other? One of the only places we have a movement of opposition in our body is at the thumb. We review the, the movement of flexion, bringing the thumb in towards the body. Extension, moving that thumb out away from the body and opposition. Also, the thumb is sometimes known as the pollux. We see several muscles with that P-O-L-L -L name attached to the thumb. Look at the flexor pollis longus flexor pollis brevis. That's because the anatomical name for the thumb is the pollux. Moving up the arm, we review the brachialis. Now some would consider this a, uh, a muscle of the upper arm, but look at the insertion point. It's the tuberosity and the coracoid process of the ulna. So it crosses the elbow joint. That's why we're reviewing it in the forearm. This is the brachialis. The significance of the brachialis is it's the main flexor of the elbow and it lies deep, deep, deep uh, under the bicep. Typically we're not working it under the bicep, um, but we're feeling it at the ulnar attachment. Ah, the brachioradialis. This is a great muscle to work in the forearm. It is on the side of the thumb, depending if you have your client face up or face down. Uh, easiest to work, in my opinion, face up. Uh, but you'll see the action, origin, insertion, and innerviation. 
about to review this just a little further in our next image. So do you want to find your own brachioradialis? Put your fist, soft fist, under the desk and just push up. It's going to pop right up on the top of that arm, the thumb side. This is mainly a flexor of the elbow, but it also assists in bending your wrist backwards. It gets overworked by excessive gripping. And so as a sports massage therapist, I love working this muscle because this is a muscle that is the culprit in tennis elbow and golfer's elbow very often. So lateral and medial epicondylitis. Uh, brachioradialis is one of a couple of muscles that it gives wonderful relief to those golfers and tennis people. Here we have images of the extensors of the wrist and fingers. And it's fairly easy to identify these guys because the majority of them have extensor in the name. And for those of you who are detail oriented and like to know origins and insertion points, I've included the detail on the extensors. Here is the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. The action, origin, insertion, and innerviation. Massage therapists sometimes find their own extensor carpi ulnaris uh, in having a little bit of tension. Here's an image of where it flows in the forearm. Sometimes while working the forearm, the massage therapist will ask the client to extend and flex their wrist. Uh, the action um, of the extensor digitorum is to extend the second through fifth fingers. It'll pop that muscle right up and allow us to work it quite nicely during a massage if we include movement of flexion and extension of the wrist. These muscles are probably starting to look familiar. Flexors of the wrist and fingers, almost all of them have flexor in the name. On the Emblex exam, there are very few questions about the flexor carpi radialis. However, for those detail-oriented pe people who want to see the action, origin, insertion, and innervation, here you go. So the only flexor of the wrist that does not have flex in the name would be the palmaris longus. It is a strong flexor of the wrist. However, just based on the name, you would probably have a sense that it does something with the hand or the wrist or the forearm. Palm, palmaris, it's actually a flexor of the wrist. The final flexor of the wrist is the flexor carpi ulnaris, uh, but it also adducts the wrist. Uh, so you can see it's located on the pinky side of the forearm, uh, an image of the action origins, insertion, and innervation is provided. All right, guys, you hanging in there? We're in the home stretch, I promise. There's not going to be a lot of questions on your massage bodywork licensing exam on the muscles of the thumb and the hand, but I just want you to be familiar with some of them. So you see the P-O-L-L-I-C-I-S, those are attached with that thumb, and I believe I'm pronouncing it wrong, but polysis. Um, but the thumb again is the pollux, just so that you have a point of reference. We see where all those extensors lead right down to the top of the hand. Those extensors of the wrist lead right into the fingers. We are going to highlight just a couple of the muscles of the hand, the abductor pollicis longus. You can see actions, origins, insertions, and innervations there. More so familiar with that it actually abducts the thumb, extends the thumb, moves the thumb, uh, and abducts the wrist. The long muscles of the thumb, we have kind of a fun name, the anatomical snuff box. This is a triangular deepening on the radial dorsal aspect of the hand. And the name originates from the use of this surface for placing the, sn the sniffing powdered tobacco, sometimes called snuff. That's where people would put it and go ahead and sniff it. <laughs> the anatomical snuff box on the long muscles of the thumb. Woohoo! It's a wrap. That's it. You did it. You got through 
all of the anatomy of the upper body of the shoulder, upper arm, forearm, wrist, and hand. Congratulations. Great job on hanging in there. And you know, let me just congratulate you on taking the time to prepare for this all important exam. I'm really glad you're taking this time. Now you get a chance to put your new knowledge to work and complete the quiz. So best of luck with that. And I look forward to being with you next time in our next MLEX Review Course Lecture. Have a great day.